Hey everyone and welcome to Video Games and Literature. This is uh, lecture number three. Uh, this week uh, I'm going to give a short lecture that will lead into our short stories. Uh, you have four short stories to read this week. Uh, they appear in our week three folder. Uh, there should be uh, three PDF files and then one is a Word document or a, a document that's got a link to uh, the fourth which is a hypertext uh, short story. Uh, this week's task, you're going to pick one of these short stories and I'll talk about what to do with it. You're going to uh, lead discussion of the short story. You're going to need to post that by Wednesday. Uh, you're going to submit your post for the week by Friday uh, and then contribute your usual 500 words to discussion. Uh, next week we're going to be playing Braid, so if you don't have that yet, you're going to want to get a copy of it. Uh, it's available on uh, most major platforms and Steam if you have that. Uh, also looking ahead, next week is going to be your comparison paper. That's the first major paper, and you're going to have a draft of that due on uh, the 8th. Uh, but we'll talk about the specifics of that next week. So your lecture. Uh, last week uh, we learned about games as action. And so if you're going to read a video game, uh, we have to think about the actions that supplement the representations. Uh, that action part is supposed to be what differentiates games from print literature. And of course, we all know that pressing buttons on a controller and turning pages in a book involve different mental and physical processes. Even so, both are actions of some sort. So when you read the short story Virtual Love this week, uh, though you're not playing World of Warcraft, reading is itself uh, an activity. So it is possible to uh, read literature with this concept in mind. Unfortunately, the way people think and talk about reading doesn't always take uh, its activity very seriously. What we suggest that the way to compare literature and video games is to think of playing them or reading them as a process of excavation, uh, as a process where you're uh, digging in the ruins of an abandoned civilization, trying to uh, basically recover uh, what they were like uh, based on uh, the artifacts that you find. The problem is that uh, with this, the problem with this metaphor, and there are probably many, but this is what I'm focusing on, is that ancient civilizations didn't build their cities with archaeologists in mind. Uh, however, authors and game developers, in a sense, do. They are fully aware of the fact that someone's going to read it, that, they're, uh, that someone's going to read their essay, that someone's going to play their game, and they're designed around how people are going to engage those media. So we hear all the time that games are immersive, they let us role play in alternative possible worlds. Or maybe if you're Bogos, we get to excavate their ruins. And we even hear things about how games far outpace literature in, this, in the immersion department. Uh, two things though. Uh, first, immersion in gaming is basically the same idea as getting lost in a book. Uh, both meta metaphors proceed from some of the same assumptions about how people are going to interact with projected worlds. Second, games and books and fictional worlds of all kinds depend on users knowing that they're engaging with fictions and not the real thing or the thing that's being represented. If you were reading Don Quixote and actually believed that you're transported to 17th century Spain, uh, you'd be committed to the Looney Bin. So authors and game developers uh, share a similar problem of interface. They can set up certain types of engagements. You press buttons, hear music or dialogue, uh, watch moving images. Uh, you can turn pages, uh, there's a written word, so on, uh, and have to get, but still have to get their users to see the world and follow along. Uh, they have to imagine their audience presented with tools that they supply, them then working with them and fighting with them to then build the fictional space. As a reader then, perhaps it's less excavation uh, that we're doing uh, as much as we're following the directions of the ancient city's architect tools at hand, which the architect imagines that we have, uh, language or gamepad, you have to bring the architectural plans to life. Uh, so I'm going to get a little carried away with this metaphor today, I think, but uh, that's all right. Uh, perhaps what you build isn't exactly what the architect had in mind, uh, but it might work anyway, anyway, or you may find that it lacks the structural integrity and falls apart. Either way, whatever you're building is built from schematics that you can refer back to as you go, or the game or the text or whatever it is that you happen to be analyzing for, uh, for this uh, process. 
So with this in mind, let's go look at essay structures and paragraph structures. You may recognize this as a five-paragraph essay. Uh, it has an introduction paragraph that ends in a thesis, three support paragraphs that each present evidence, every statement of the thesis, which is the first paragraph of the conclusion. This is the model of essay writing that's been widely taught as the, the generic way to write essay uh, throughout high schools across the country. And it's generally effective because it has all the components of a su successful essay. However, it can be really limiting and tends to, pro and tends to produce and when students are really thinking in its structures, really boring arguments that supply evidence rather than advanced ideas. So you have the classic example of Odysseus as an epic hero because he has qualities X, Y, and Z. And then support paragraph one, topic sentence one, Odysseus demonstrates quality X. Then here is a quotation in which he demonstrates quality X, and so on and so on and so on. Once you get to college level writing, yeah, your support paragraphs need to develop ideas, not just deliver evidence. If you have an essay in which you say and repeat the same idea three different times with three pieces of evidence, uh, you're not going to get a very good grade because you're not really getting that deep into the topic, you're just repeating yourself. So we're going to talk about parts of the, most of the parts of the essay later on the, the uh, semester or term. Uh, for now though, I want to focus on the support paragraph. Support paragraph is like a mini five paragraph essay. You have the topic sentence, which is basically the claim of your paragraph. You have support for it, which is usually three, sen three to four sentences or more. Uh, and this is where you're gonna end up putting your quotations or your textual uh, reference evidence. Then you have a conclusion, which is a final developing insight or your transition to the next point. Now, if we take the model uh, that I was suggesting er earlier, reading slash playing as building from an architectural plans, you're going to want to think of your support paragraph as a place where you're fleshing out the details of your inter interpretation, of the, the room and the structure that you're building. So often young writers will develop quotations as evidence. I think X, and here's a quotation where I think X is happening, and then move on. However, if you think of your essay as building some aspect of an ancient town, for example, the quotations can't just be evidence because you're not doing evidentiary work. Uh, they're your reference. It's your looking back to the plans. I think the room looks like this. Here's where I think it's, it, here is a part of the plans uh, that I want to look to or where I, I'm looking to see that. And then it sort of moves on that way. It says this in the text or here's this aspect of the text. This is why I think the room's going to look the way that it does. So I'm going on this too long and belaboring this abstract metaphor to death. Uh, still, I hope it's making some, some kind of sense. Uh, we're going to try to practice this week uh, with our short stories. The reading this week, each, in the reading this week, each of these short stories uh, are explicitly thinking about us as we read them uh, and about this problem of interface and how to lead people uh, to conclusions or to lead people along a path to a kind of building uh, across an interface or through a medium. Uh, Lost in a Fun House is going to speak directly to the reader about the task of reading at hand. Continuity of Parks is going to invert and place the reader right at its center. Uh, virtual Love is the most uh, traditional structure, but it's still thinking about mediation and interface uh, in a digital world. And My Boyfriend Came Back from the War is a hypertext narrative that's going to unfold differently each time you read it. Uh, part of the reason I picked each of these is I think they're dealing with aspects that are particularly relevant to video games. Uh, and I'm hoping that by engaging them in the way that we're going to try to engage them this week, uh, by thinking of them as uh, architectural plans that have us in mind or our process of building in mind while they're writing them, uh, I'm hoping that'll help us think about reading and playing in, in similar kinds of ways. So for your activity this week, like you please pick, pick one of these stories and read it carefully uh, with attention to how it tries to anticipate the way in which you're going to build this world. Once you pick one of these stories, uh, I'm going to have them all listed out in a post on Google+. Uh, just write as a comment in there which one that you're claiming. Uh, I want you to read all the stories, but I want you to read that one uh, especially carefully, the one that you picked especially carefully, uh, because you're going to be leading discussion on it. 
So you're going to make the first post on your story, uh, and that's going to be due on Wednesday by 10 p.m. And for that post, uh, so you're going to create a new post, you're going to put it in the discussion category, you're going to write one solid, bold topic sentence uh, that points in a direction for the building, uh, for building a reading of your short story. Uh, your sentence should specifically address the way that your story is anticipating the way readers are going to interact with it. Uh, once you have your post up, uh, you'll get one from each of the members of the class. Uh, I'd like you to then contribute to each to the discussion of each of these stories. Uh, so your contribution, uh, you want to think of it as additive, so imagine that you're filling in the detail of the room that's imagined by the original poster in their topic sentence. It's a little abstract. I hope this makes sense. We're going to try it out. If it isn't working, we'll, we'll, we'll try something else, or I'll give you more detail later. Once that's finished, uh, when you start working on your post for the week, uh, your post is going to be on the short, short story you selected, and now you've got this one really developed idea that your classmates have helped you fill in. Uh, take that and let it inform your full-fledged weekly post. Uh, and that's going to be due uh, on Friday, uh, like it always is. So your task this week, uh, claim one of the short stories on Google+. Uh, I'll have a post up and you're going to claim the story, just say which one you want to do in the comment. I don't want multiple people working on the same one, so if you see one's already taken, pick one of the others. Then, uh, by Wednesday at 10 p.m., please post your topic sentence about your story. Again, you want to bold something that's imagining something that's imagining a, a pr productive direction of discussion uh, for that uh, for that story. Something that that really needs fleshing out. Then, contribute your usual discussion. Uh, but I'm asking you to make sure you comment on each person's each of the short stories this week, and submit your usual post by Friday, but this time your post is going to be on your short story. If you have any questions, uh, make sure you uh, send me an email or post them under support on Google+. Thank you, and I'll see you next week.